Judgment Day is something that Allah talks about in many places in the Qur'an and usually when He talks about it, He talks about people that are heading towards Jannah, the believers, and people that are heading towards the hellfire, the disbelievers. But this passage in particular is unique because Allah instead of comparing believers to disbelievers, He compares believers to hypocrites. Allahumma la taj'alna minhum, may Allah not make us from them. But Allah instead of comparing those who have faith as opposed to those who have no faith, is actually comparing people who have faith as opposed to people who thought they have faith or pretended to have faith or their faith was there but is of no value to Allah on the Day of Judgment. This is the munafiq. May Allah not make us from them. But this, this is why this passage is of particular importance because it tells us many things about how not to end up on that, in that scene on Judgment Day. To summarize what's going on in this passage, Allah Azza wa says that on the Day of Judgment, believers, when they stand, the Prophet ﷺ will be able to see them يَوْمَ تَرَى meaning إِشَارَ إِلَى الرَّسُولِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. The Messenger can see the entire Ummah الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ Believing men and women يَسْعَى نُورُهُمْ بَيْنَ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَبِأَيْمَانِهِمْ Their light is going to be coming out from right in front of them and from their right. What that means is, we have light coming from our hearts, from our chests, and we have lights coming out of our hands. Why is that important? Because your Iman and my Iman, if it's sincere, if my faith is sincere to Allah, and my belief was strong, it actually turns into light on Judgment Day. And what I, that faith made me act in a certain way. Those actions that I took turn into light on Judgment Day, the actions of my hand. So you have two torches on Judgment Day. The Day of Judgment is dark, it's this long walk to Jannah. And you're gonna need light to get there. Some people are going to have exhaustive light. Their light is so stretched that the Prophet ﷺ would describe that it could go from one city to another. Is that big of a light. Other people have such weak light, they still have it, but it's so weak, they can barely see the next step that they're taking. So there are people with different capacities of light, and they are now making their way, and Allah has congratulated them because they at least have light, as opposed to people who have no light, they don't have any chance of getting to Jannah. They can't see a path. And so Allah says, بُشْرَاكُمُ الْيَوْمْ جَنَّاتٌ تَجْرِيبٍ تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارِ خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا Congratulations to all of you of gardens, at the bottoms of which rivers are flowing, it's right ahead of you, keep walking, keep going, keep going. But then in the next ayah, Allah describes a group of people that also get up on Judgment Day and they notice they have no light and they're in the middle of the dark. And they see far ahead and they see, you know, if you can imagine this scene, there's complete pitch black darkness and there's a group of people that seem to have some torches with them. You don't even see them, you just see some lights flickering. So you realize, I need to, I better catch up with them because those lights are getting dimmer. So these hypocrites wake up in this dark scene on Judgment Day, and they try to run and catch up to the believers because they have no light of their own. They wake up and they're in shock that they have nothing that can aid them. So, يَوْمَ يَقُولُ الْمُنَافِقُونَ وَالْمُنَافِقَاتِ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا انظُرُونَ نَقْتَبِسْ مِنْ نُورِكُمْ The day on which hypocritical men and women are going to say to those who've believed, wait for us, hold on, look back towards us. We could get some of your light. نَقْتَبِسْ مِنْ نُورِكُمْ Iqtibas literally means, you know, in old days you had these torches with fires on top and you can take your wood and you can kind of light up your own torch. So they figure we can go borrow some of your light, it won't take anything away from yours. Hold on a second, help us out here. And then a voice is heard, Qila, irji'u wara'akum. Go back behind yourselves, go turn back. Faltamisu nura, find some light. We're not gonna help. A day of judgment, the day of judgment is the day on which a mother doesn't care about her child. The, the day on which, you know, father and son and brother and sister, this is all these relationships, تَقَطَّعَتْ بِهِمُ الْأَسْبَابِ All relationships are cut. So who's gonna care about who? I just need to get to my Jannah, mind your own business. I'm not, I'm not even turning back. Go back and find some light yourself. And the idea of going back actually is sarcasm also. Go back to this world. Because on Judgment Day, you, if you don't come on Judgment Day with light, you can't get any. The only way to gain that light was in this world. فَلْتَمِسُوا نُورًا so now they still try to catch up because they don't want to hear it, right? So they're still trying to catch up. And as they get closer and closer to the believers, فَبُرِبَ بَيْنَهُمْ بِسُورٍ لَهُ بَابٍ A massive, gigantic wall is dropped between them, which happens to have a door. And the door, inshallah, will maybe some other time we'll talk about. But Allah says a massive, giant wall is dropped between these two groups. So even if they were going to try to catch up, now they can't. As the wall is dropped, Allah says, بَاطِنُهُ فِيهِ rahma. The side they can no longer see, the hidden side of it, that's got mercy and love and care in it. 
وَظَاهِرُهُ مِنْ قِبَلِهِ الْعَذَابِ And right behind it, approaching them, right approaching them is punishment. So not only were they in the dark, now there's a massive wall, you got nowhere to go. And when you look back, there's punishment coming at you. They're about to be crushed. So these hypocrites, may Allah not make us from them, become desperate. So they call out and they say, Alam nakum ma'akum. Didn't we used to be with you? Weren't we with you? So they're asking for the people of the other side. Apparently the door can op be opened from the other side. Open up guys, come on, we used to be with you. And so a desperate call is made. This is important before we go any further. This is actually the reason I chose these ayat for today's khutbah. This wording, Alam nakum ma'akum, weren't we with you? The idea is that these people on Judgment Day that are standing on the wrong side of the wall, that are in desperate situation, that have no light of themselves, actually assumed that they belonged among the believing community. They were very confident about that. So much so that they're citing it even on Judgment Day, we used to be among you. We prayed with you, we did business with you, we were friends with you, we were family with you, we were cousins with you. We went to the same college, university, we're, we're all the same guys. How are we separated today? Why is this separation happening today? And from the other side, this time, now that they feel safe, you know once the wall is dropped, not only do these people get overly terrified, the people on the other side feel far more secure, so they're not in a rush anymore. Because now it's totally safe. So now they take their time and actually answer them and say, well, here's why you're not with us today. Here's why you're not with us today. You know, the first thing the people of heaven told them was you have to go get some, your, some of your own light. Find some light on your own. Go back and get it. Apparently you don't have any light. And then they're in shock, we, were, we used to be with you, we should have had light just like you have light. So now the people of Jannah are going to describe how these people who used to have light, they used to have light, they used to have faith. How did they lose it? How did they end up bankrupt on Judgment Day? And this ayah is particularly profound because then it will give us an insight into how does someone lose their iman? How does someone end up taking the most priceless treasure that they can have in this life, our, our faith, and end up squandering it and losing it. There's a, it doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't just, you don't just lose your iman. It's a process. And that process has been described in these timeless words. Bala, of course you used to be with us. Walakinnakum fatantum anfusakum. However, you put yourselves, I'll, I'll do a rough translation first and I'll explain. Number one, you put yourselves in fitna, you put yourselves in trial. Fatana in Arabic actually means to put something to the test. Fatana is also used when you, when you test the purity of gold and you melt it and impurities come out. Like it, gold doesn't go through an easy test, it goes through a painful burning test. The idea of fatantum anfusakum, there are many lessons associated with it, but for the purposes of this khutbah, I'll highlight one of them. You kept putting yourselves in situations where your faith gets tested. Try to understand what that means. You kept putting yourself in environments where you knew it was bad for you, but you said, no, I can handle it. I, I got this, I got this. You kept surrounding yourselves with friends that would do bad things, say bad things, see bad things, go to bad places, but you said, I'm not like them, I'm just trying to help them. And you kept going back into those environments. You kept getting into gatherings and places and situations. You, put, you kept putting yourselves in those places, assuming that it will not have any effect on you. It'll affect everyone else, but it won't, it won't affect you. You know, the first step wasn't that these people just became disbelievers, it was actually bad company. They put themselves in questionable circumstances. And they assume that it's not going to have an effect. You know, when you are, you know, I'll give you a silly example, but it'll get the point across. If people do a lot of cooking at home, especially if you're a desi household, you do a lot of cooking at home, the home smells like a lot of masala. But if you live there, you don't smell it. When somebody else walks in, especially if an Arab walks into your house, they feel like they're in some contaminated zone. It hits them really hard. But a couple of hours later, they're like, oh, it's, it's just oxygen now. You understand? When you first put yourself in a bad environment, you might feel it. You might feel, this isn't good. This is, this is gonna mess me up. I don't think I should be here. Your heart will feel uncomfortable. But if you keep putting yourself in that situation over and over and over and over again, guess what? It doesn't bother you anymore. 
somebody who smells, you know, stands next to a smoker for the first time is coughing and their eyes are burning. But if they start smoking themselves a year later, that just becomes their oxygen. They can't even breathe normally without smoking. It changes them altogether. The first problem was you put yourselves, you surrounded yourselves in a bad environment. Fatantum anfusak. What was the second problem? The second problem was watarabastum. You kept procrastinating. Now what does that mean? That means you realized it's bad, and you also realized in your own conscience, I should change, but you told yourself, I'll change pretty soon inshallah. I'm gonna change, I know I have to change, I know this is bad, just one more week, and I'm gonna be a different person. Man, just this semester, I got these messed up friends right now, and I can't really make them upset, so I'm gonna keep hanging out with them, but next semester, I'm totally doing a different schedule, I'm not gonna be around these guys anymore. But just let me just write out this semester. Just this one more month I'm doing this, you know? Just this one more weekend, just this one or two more party, just one or two more drinks. That you keep telling yourself just a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And then people tell my, my favorite one, Ramadan is right around the corner. It's just 10 more months, 11 more months, you know? Once, I, once Ramadan comes, man, I'll be totally different. And I plan to go to Hajj. Once I go to Hajj, oh, you watch, I'm gonna be a different person. But until then, you know, just kind of, just make dua for me. Tarabbastu. You didn't want to make a change today, right now. You figured, you assumed, not only are you putting yourselves in a bad environment, you're not ready to make a transformation right now. It's too much for you to be asked. You'd rather just stick it out. You'd rather just enjoy a little bit more. This is what tarabbastu. But you know what? And you assume, by the way, this, this also has an assumption. The first assumption was it doesn't affect you. It doesn't have an impact on you, but it does. Something really bad becomes normal to you over time. You get desensitized. What is the effect of tarabbus, of holding off and holding off and holding off? Actually, you assume that you can put the brakes on at any time. And you can walk away from all of it whenever you want. I'm not addicted. I don't need this. I'm not hooked on it. I could just walk away whenever I feel like. The truth of it is, that's not the case. The longer you stay, the more addicted you become, and the more impossible you feel, you can't get. Out. it's impossible for you to get out of it. You're completely immersed. You're completely drowned. And you don't even know what anymore what it is to be outside of this environment. And then you start telling yourself, it's too late for me. And when that happens, a guilt sets in. The guilt sets in that I'm pretty messed up. Man, I've been doing sins. I've been in this bad environment. I should have made tawbah a long time ago, but it's too late for me. And that bad, nobody likes to feel bad. Nobody likes to feel guilty. And then shaitan comes and says, why do you feel guilty? You don't have to feel guilty. The only thing that's making you feel guilty is this Islam thing. Islam says this is haram and that's haram and that's a sin and that's a sin. And you can't do this and you can't say that and you can't go there. It keeps, Islam keeps making you feel bad, man. I want you to feel good. What, how true is Islam anyway? And now the thoughts start running in this person's mind, a man or a woman. Why am I even following Islam? It seems like it just wants me not to be happy. I just want to live my life, man. I just want to be free. I just want to be able to do what I want. I just want to be able to hang out with my friends. I'm not so sure about the Quran anyway. How do we even know there is a God? How do we even know? Well, what's this hadith business? I mean, how's it, how do we even know it's authentic? And so you have this young man or woman this Zainab, this Ali, this Fatima, this Abdullah, this Kareem, these beautiful names. And now they're starting to ask questions about, I'm not so sure about this Islam. I don't know. I have doubts. I have serious doubts. And these are not PhDs in philosophy. Nor do they have exhaustive education in Islamic history where they studied it and they started developing doubts. No, no, no. They were in a bad environment. They didn't change themselves. That is the process. I've, I've talked to hundreds of these people that literally lived this ayah. They live this ayah, and then they get to a point where they have doubts. But their doubts have nothing to do with logic or reason. As a matter of fact, when you answer one doubt, they go to the next doubt. When you answer that one, they go to the next one. When you answer that one, you go to the next one. Then you say, hold on a second. So how long ago did you start ending up in questionable kinds of company? And then the truth starts coming out. Wartabtu. The very next words are, you fell into doubt. You started doubting. You know what doubt will do? It'll let you off the hook. You'll be able to say to yourself, well, it's not really absolutely the truth anyway. So I shouldn't feel bad that I don't follow it. I shouldn't feel bad. And now once those doubts settle in, and you hide behind those doubts, and continue to justify your life of procrastination and putting yourself in fitna. Once you get to that point, 
then two things are taken away from you. The desire for Jannah is taken away. The desire for making Allah happy is taken away. The desire to have that light that will make you run and get to that destination, you don't even have that in this world. The person who desires to seek that success with Allah, Allah will give them that in this world. But that desire is gone now. You have doubts about it. And the fear of hell is gone. Those, those two things are gone. Your fears are gone, and your, your, your hopes and aspirations in Allah and the Akhirah are gone. The afterlife is nothing to you. The afterlife means nothing. If somebody even brings up heaven and hell, it's a joke to you. Well, if you take away heaven and hell, if you take away the motivation to end up in the reward of Allah, or get away from the punishment of Allah on Judgment Day, well, the only motivation you're going to have left are things that are left in this world, isn't it? You have nothing left in the next life. So the only thing to look forward to are stuff that's left in this life. And this life will be money, it'll be fame, it'll be leisure, it'll be pleasure, you know, it'll be material things. That's all you ever think about, that's all you ever care about, that's all you ever want to know about, that's the only thing that ever interests you, that's the only thing you make efforts towards, because you think all of these things are going to bring you happiness. They'll bring you contentment. So the next words are, وَغَرَّتْكُمُ الْأَمَانِيُّ False hopes deceived you. You had false hopes that some kind of worldly thing will bring you happiness, and you ran after it. You gave all of your life to it. And you would think that this will bring you what you're looking for and you get to it. Like people wanting to see, you know, people nowadays obsessed with the next movie that comes out, the next toy, the next device that comes out, right? Lines for the new Star Wars longer than passports for Hajj, you know? Why? Because you need to go see it. If, if you don't see it, how, how does your life have any purpose? How, how, you know, your life means nothing if you didn't see it opening night, you know? And so you have to see it, and by the way, hoping that this will bring you some kind of fulfillment that you haven't found anywhere else. And people walk out of it and say, that was pretty awesome, and then they're bored again. Like, what do I do now? Maybe I can go see it again. And then go see it again, they're like, well, not as exciting the first time, but uh, still pretty cool. You keep looking for something more to fulfill you and fulfill you. Because the thing that will completely fulfill you, the pleasure of Allah, is no longer there. That desire is no longer there. وَغَرَّتْكُمُ الْأَمَانِيُّ حَتَّى جَاءَ أَمْرُ اللَّهِ Until the decision of Allah came. This was your life. This, according to the believers, is a summary of a person's life. That lost their faith. They started just with putting themselves in a questionable environment, and from there, it's a downward spiral. Automatically, the next thing is, you start getting hooked on it, you put off, and then later on, you start developing doubts. And from there, the only thing you ever work towards is worldly, lustful, material gain, material desires. وَغَرَّكُمْ بِاللَّهِ الْغَرُورِ And then Allah says the one, the ultimate, the ultimate deceiver, غَرُور is مُبَالَغَة The incredible deceiver was successful in deceiving you. This is what the believers say to the, the munafiqun on the other side of the wall. This is an incredible scene folks. They're standing by this wall in shock, why aren't we on the other side? And now they're being reminded by their fellow believers on the other side, well remember that you did this, this, this and this?